let's talk about health so we have heard doctors strike has gotten into the has entered the 13th day clinical officers are threatening to go on strike lab technicians are saying they want to go on strike first of the eighth <laughs> I don't know MPs are threatening to impeach the minister. <laughs> All those things are happening. The point is when people are going to seek health services, are they getting the health services that they want? The Director General of Health is the Dr. Patrick Amoth, currently still in, in an acting capacity. He's our next guest in the Situation Room. Dr. Ari, good morning. Good morning, Eric. Welcome to the hot seat of the Situation Room. Thanks for having me. It's good to have you here. We will be discussing very many things that we've talked about, you know, as the boss of provision of health in the service in the country, you have a lot to tell us and to educate us and to answer. CT will first give you the day's proverb. Every week he goes to one African country, then he brings us proverbs from that country. What we'd like you to do is listen to the proverb and give us your interpretation of it. Are you ready? Ready. Very good, CT. Go. Yes, the cleverness of one alone is a shallow well that soon dries up the cleverness of one alone is a shallow well that soon dries up this is a proverb from mauritius the yes the island republic of, of mauritius. mauritius yes dr amorth mm. what's your interpretation of that proverb nice proverb my interpretation is that you cannot be able to do everything alone you need the rest of uh, the community, the rest of the people, so that we can be able to prosper and move forward together as one big people. Mm. City? He has interpreted it very well. It's clear it speaks to him in the manner he has just mentioned. Mm. Yes, and he understands you cannot do these things alone. This lone ranger mentality where someone thinks they can do everything on their own is completely misguided. Where's Mick? No, nah, you need others. <laughs> you need others to walk mm. the journey with you. Mm. Dr. Amoth, what's the job of the Director General of Health? The job of the Director General of Health is one of those jobs that is prescribed in law under the Health Act 2017. And one of the responsibilities of the Director General of Health is to be able to advise the government on all, all health matters in the health sector. Number two is, to the, is the principal technical advisor to the cabinet secretary. Number three is to advise the two levels of government on health related issues. Number four is to prevent introduction of uh, diseases into the country. Mm. Number five is to be able to support uh, data generation and uh, research on health matters. Number five, the director general is also responsible for the internship program. And six is to be able to advise the ministry on licensing of health facilities. And usually there is a caveat in all the description as any other responsibility assigned by the appointing authority. Just to name but a few. <laughs> so that you don't leave anything to chance. Yeah. yeah. So basically, um, the Director General of Health should be a doctor. For, by you to, for you to offer all these advisory services and to oversee all these things, mm. you, by expectation, should be a doctor, isn't it? By the definition and what is in the law, yes, that is true, according to the Health Act uh, 2017, Clause 17. So I'm right to say that you're the senior most doctor in the country. <laughs> <laughs> By virtue of my position, but I have also my seniors who taught me who are working in various sectors. Okay. Yeah. All right. So when we have the a smooth running health sector, we have a lot to thank the Director General of Health. True. Similarly, when we have challenges in the provision of health, in accessing health, we have a lot of questions to pose to the Director General of Health. Correct. Okay, let's now start posing the questions. Currently, Dr. Tari, mm -hmm. doctors are on strike. Thirteenth day. They've been raising issues. There have been meetings in the ministry. This, uh, there's been about implementation of CBOs, CBAs. There has been an issue of posting of interns, medical interns, plus others. Why are we where we are today? We are where we are today because one of historical issues, two, the changing ecosystem in the health sector, 
Uh, for a long time, you know, we only had one medical school, the University of Nairobi. Now we have 13 medical schools. So the total number of people we are churning out in terms of our graduates from our training institutions has increased. While in terms of our guidelines, our policies, those policies have not changed in tandem with the changing ecosystem. So, for example, what we are going through now in terms of the placement of interns is a question of... Um, uh, and we need to look at this through the entire value chain mm. from entry point into the training institutions, the exact training program and where we get the out the products or the outputs and the end consumer of this product or output, which is the, principally the Ministry of Health and, of course, the private sector and the faith-based faith organizations. Mm. So for a long time, we have operated on the paradigm that um, the numbers were manageable. If you look at the total number of interns that have graduated over the 10-year period, the number has increased threefold, from 214 in uh, 2014 to around now 880-something, close to 900. Mm. Uh, that number has increased despite the allocation for the Ministry of Health for the internship program not increasing in tandem with the increasing numbers. Mm. And of course, that num increasing number also brings other issues, including where do we place them? Because we have a fixed number of internship uh, uh, positions in uh, uh, different facilities. Mm. And because internship is principally an experiential learning, where you're supposed now to translate the theory that you are taught into medical school, into clinical practice, how you can be able to examine a patient, how you can be able to pick a specimen, how do you communicate with a patient? then it is imperative that the numbers then are also in tandem with the facilities where this training is going to take place including the necessary infrastructure the necessary human capital in terms of the health specialists because internship you work under supervision of mm. medical officers and the specialists mm. so basically for now the problem has been uh, underfunding in terms of exchequer mm. And uh, we noted this uh, in, in, in 2023, the Honorable Cabinet Secretary communicated to her counterpart in the National Treasury, mm. requesting for additional funding to be able to support the internship program. Mm. The response from the Treasury was that uh, it is no longer sustainable with the numbers that we have, and the Minister was advised to be able to develop a policy position to look at the numbers that could be sustainable within the fiscal space that mm -hmm. obtains us at now. Mm -hmm. And in the final comments of the CS Treasury, one is that the budget 2023-2024 was being implemented under tight fiscal framework and uh, with the projected uh, revenues not meeting the object objectives and they and also increased uh, requests or requirements for payment of um, other priorities including loans and therefore we advise to rationalize what we have within and as a result of that our request was not honored mm. so basically that is the genesis of this problem okay so now that's where it all started that's what's currently going on um the number of things that you've said even before this is that you said one of the problems that mm. plagues this arena is that policies that have gone over time unchanged so that's one now when you put that together with some of the issues that you've talked about here fiscal framework tight fiscal framework what is not available rationalize things that this arena again has previously done what would that mean and would it make sense then if one of the things they said was, okay, let's not send the number of interns that we are sending out into the different spaces, let's reduce on that number. Would such a thing then make sense from a health services point of view? It will make sense from a fiscal perspective. Mm -hmm. But of course, if you look at our numbers in regards to the health workforce that we require vis-a-vis -vis our population and our demands, that is not a good thing to do mm. but so it's a, a, a dilemma kind of a situation where you have to balance things out here you don't have sufficient numbers but on the flip side you also don't have the adequate resources eh? mm. so you need to be able to balance and find out 
what can be able to work for your population. And one of the things that we did uh, was to be able to have a paradigm shift in delivery of healthcare services in this country. Ever since we got independence, our health service delivery has been curative driven. You get sick, you go to hospital. In mm. fact, our insurance, national insur health insurance scheme was called the National Hospital Insurance Fund, mm. meaning you could only be able to access that service if you are in a hospital. Mm. Uh, if you are in hospital, so we are basically funding sickness. Mm. But now, what uh, the global world has told us is that it is better to prevent disease than actually deal with the sickness, mm. and that is why we have had this fundamental shift towards primary health care based on a strong community health system trying to use the community health promoters as people to help us in basic things but also to increase demand generation for healthcare services through a preventive promotive approach knowing very well that even the who has projected going forward that the global community is going to have a shortfall of 10 million healthcare workers 45 percent of that shortage will be in low middle income countries mostly in sub-saharan africa so for the foreseeable future, we are going to have a challenge in terms of numbers of healthcare workers. And the best way that we have been told global world over to be able to achieve universal health coverage is by investing in primary health care systems. Because these systems are inclusive, they are comprehensive, they promote inclusivity and equity, ensuring that nobody is left behind in terms of health service delivery. Okay. The number of institutions that were offering uh, medical education like you said we've increased from one to 13 to 13 now mm. the number of students graduating mm. with a medical degree has increased 214 just uh, 10 years ago to close to 900 to close to 900 presently those are locally trained graduates locally I trained. remember there are also graduates who train outside and Kenyans they come. who go to Tanzania Kenyans who go to Ukraine, Kenyans who go to all over, and, India, and they come back. And they all come that back. That is yeah. another 500, around 500. Every year? Yes, graduates every year. Okay. But we've been knowing this. We have been seeing it increasing. I mean, it's government that licenses these institutions and allows them to offer these uh, courses. The Ministry of Health is vis it can see this is happening. We have X number of students now in school studying and they're there for six years, so they, surely it's not like a six-month course where you, you may have turned the other side. What has happened over the years in terms of the Ministry of Health communicating to the National Treasury, communicating to Parliament on budgetary allocation? Uh, that communication always takes place, but we need more funding. But that communication that goes to the National Treasury, to Parliament, comes from all state departments in the government. Mm. So here you have one piece of cake everybody's angling for this cake so the, pa the the parent or the father or the mother who is distributing this cake ensures that muga gets a small piece eric gets a small piece do gets a small piece amoth gets a small piece mm. so in summary what we need to do is to be able to bake a bigger cake so that everybody's needs are satisfied mm -hmm. but you have raised something very fundamental in terms of our visibility in the training institutions Eric, you may be aware of a judgment that was passed on 11th of June 2020 by the High Court regarding Commission of University Education and various regulatory bodies. Mm. And the judgment was that it is the Commission of the University Education which has the oversight in training institutions, mm. not our regulatory bodies. Mm. So as the CEO of Kenya Medical Practitioners Dentist Board or Chairman Professor Hainga and Dr. Karyogi cannot walk to the University of Nairobi to be able to inspect that in training institution. How many doctors do you have in this class of 2023? How many lectures do we have? How many laboratories do we have? Mm -hmm. So we have no visibility and we are bad, is bad by law mm. to be able to visualize the end product that we are going to, to use. But it doesn't bar you from communicating to the universities. You know the 13 institutions that are going to be sending students to you for internship. Oric, there's something also that fundamentally happened in this country a while back. Mm. This problem did not, was not there when we used to have the regular program alone. When we started having the parallel program, eh. which is a good thing, mm. so that we can be able to make education accessible to all, mm. 
I think the interpretation of our teachers regarding the parallel program was not correct. The parallel program has been interpreted as a source of revenue. And now we are battling even with quality issues because the numbers in terms of the space, like for example, the Nursing Council of Kenya, mm. as clear, and even the Kenya Medical Practitioners Dentist Council, as clear uh, regulations regarding the size of a class, mm. the number of lecturers that should be able to run that class, mm. the number of other facilities required to ensure that you, re uh, you received quality training, but that is not happening. And in fact, now, because of that lack of visibility, a you find universities starting courses that are usually only offered at specialist level. Somebody tells you, I'm going to give you a course in uh, epidemiology and biostatistics. From where we sit as a ministry, as an additional community, we know epidemiologists are super specialist trained people. Mm. Then they come to the ministry that uh, my daughter I actually have received uh, like four or five letters my daughter trained in this university and cannot be registered to practice so how would we register you to practice epidemiology and biostatistics and yet we know our epidemiologists you must get a fundamental degree in medicine mm -hmm. then you go and now study this deeper and deeper so definitely we need to have a conversation with the training institutions so that we can be able to align this Am I hearing you say that there is a broken system in how we are training our health workforce? Because training is not complete, even according to the law. The training of a doctor is not complete until they have completed the internship. True? So that they can then be registered by the Kenya Medical Practitioners and Dentist Council as a doctor. Very true. And this, tra this internship is the purview of then the ministry. And, and and the council at the end but you do not have any say in everything else up to that point that is why i talked of the value chain that uh, we are missing in action at a very important in a very important part of that value chain and we need to have this conversation so that we can be able to correct all this uh, that have not gone the right way but still dr i'm still uh, at a loss to imagine that graduates come to you in the last moment with a medical degree seeking to be placed for internship and that you do not know you are for example you're saying you do not know how many will be graduating this year out of these 13 universities that number is now visible because of the coordination that we are put in place through the training institutions through the Kenya Medical Practitioners and Dentists Council and because of that we changed even our posting uh, system because previously we just used to post interns once now we have had to change because of the increasing numbers now we do the first posting in quarter one of the financial year mm. and then we do the next posting in quarter three between January and and March so it is not something that is entirely it is something that we have been looking at, discussing the relevant uh, sectors, including the national treasury, the education system. You remember sometimes in 2022, we had a big conference in Mombasa, which was opened by then His Excellency President Uhuru Kenyatta to be able to look at this fundamental, yes. Yes, bringing all those actors together. Mm. That is the conversation. This is where this conversation began. And it is good that even during this strike, we need to be able to bring all these pieces together so mm. that we can be able to address this matter once and for all. We address it for futuristic, for posterity, so that we have a system that functional, is functional in, in its entirety despite the shocks thrown at it. Dr. Patrick Kamoth, the Acting Director General of Health and Ministry of Health, he, we, he is here so we can discuss the state of healthcare in this country. Which way forward? We are seeing these strikes. They're becoming sort of like a norm. We are seeing issues with provision of health services, the quality of healthcare being uh, pro provided in the country. All these questions need answers. He's here to provide those answers. Doc, even as you talk about these things and say, well, okay, so here the, the, the strike presents, you know, a golden opportunity to actually look at some of these fundamental issues that you've raised and say, look, how about we fix this thing once and for all so that we're not doing year on year 
threats of strike, actual strike, you know, and more people saying let's strike. But with the things that you've mentioned, these are fundamental issues, lack of resource, um, lack of, you know, re-strategy. Re so with the doctors having down their tools today, with clinical officers, lab techs threatening to do so tomorrow, be or the next week, because of fundamental commitments having not been met, and we can't deny that, is such action then justified in the face of it? And would that be then an adequate push for these conversations which you've admittedly stated need to happen, need to be fixed? Is it justified for that purpose? Uh, thanks, Do. Uh, first of all, strikes are very unfortunate events. And uh, effects of strike disproportionately affects women, children, elderly people, people with disabilities, people who live in underserved areas. Because these are all other people can be able to access alternative health services in case of a strike. Mm. That notwithstanding and the pronouncements of the courts, both the Labor Relations Court in um, <laughs> Labor Employment Court in Nairobi, mm. order number six, and uh, the High Court ruling in Kisumu filed by the Kisi County government that outrightly declares the strike illegal. I would still want to plead to my colleagues that we come to the negotiating table, go back to work, we negotiate on these things. You remember the Kenya Kwanza government is one of those bold governments that actually put the issue of health on its manifesto with clear, tangible goals. Yep. But that notwithstanding, this is an opportunity for us to be able to discuss these things once and for all and be able to generate a discussion and come up with tangible action points. It does not matter how long we are going to settle them. Mm. We have those things that we can be able to deal with immediately, mm. like the issue of payment of the bas basic, basic salary, mm. which, like for, the, for example, the national government has paid to the fullest. In fact, uh, we, we demand uh, a refund of 81000 from the doctors because there was an excess payment. Mm. There is the issue of the comprehensive medical insurance services. Eh? Mm. 36 counties have enhanced schemes with uh, various insurance providers. Mm. And the national government employees, of course, has a, um, a scheme under the Ministry of uh, Public Service. Mm. Our level six facilities have their own private schemes. Again, that is something that we can be able to thrash quickly over the table. Mm. and eh? So we can be able to tick the uh, uh, boxes regarding these 19 action points raised by the union. Mm. Then there are those that require medium to long term approach because of the budgetary constraints. And you know, there's a budgetary circle prescribed by law that we have to, to follow. Mm. Then we can be able to prioritize those ones in, in, in order of... Uh, what we think is important and then deal with them and give them even a timeline mm -hmm. it may not be possible to solve all these things in two three years but maybe a time frame of five to ten years we can be able to deal with these things once and for all but dr amoth one of the issues that they have raised is mm -hmm. that these conversations have taken place before and that there has been a commitment from across board but unfortunately they've not seen these things being done and that it is easy to hide under the cover of the reason of lack of resources whereby there are some things that you can actually do without the exchequer then taking that um, uh, problem on their shoulders the institution of a health service commission for example something that they've asked for forever um, some of the um, uh, contracts being made we, we understand that it has you know a, a resource responsibility attached to it as well but one of the major issues that they do bring up is that Every time that there's a threat of a strike, there's a promise to ensure the commitment is fulfilled. But then the, when they do go back to work, that that commitment then is put on the back burner and is not dealt with. What would you say about that? Thanks, Do. Let me take this with the rear view mirror. Mm -hmm. Before we launched the you know, Universal Health Coverage Program in Karich on 20th of, uh, of October last year, we had initiated a discussion with the unions, mm. the professional associations, the academic institutions, the civil society. We came up with an 17-point, uh, 18-point action plan. Mm. 
And some of the things that have led to this strike are squarely within that those 18 points that we raised, mm. we generated together mm. at uh, Windsor Go 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 Golf Club. Mm. Uh, in our approach towards universal, universal health coverage, we also had pillars, and one of the pillars of UHC is Human Resources for Health. Mm. And in, ter in terms of sequencing, we, had, we have four pillars. Pillar one is health financing, pillar two, health products and technologies, Pillar three is the digital in, uh, health information system. And pillar four is human resources for health. Mm. And pillar four is the living pillar of all this because it is the one that has the human face. Mm. And in terms of sequencing, we said we can be able to quickly turn around the health financing, mm -hmm. change, and you saw the laws that we passed to be able to move from NHIF to now Social Health Authority. Mm. In terms of health products and technologies, again, we thought that was a low-lying fruit. We could be able to take administrative decisions, mm. give additional uh, capital to CAMSA, make changes here and there in terms of cons composition of the board. Again, that has been done, and now our order fill rate has improved significantly, especially for essential medicines and medical supplies. Mm. And in the digital ecosystem, again, that has moved, and we are working with the consortium, including Safaricom and the big hitters in the telcos, to be able to change how we deliver healthcare services. The human pillar of uh, UHC is the most difficult pillar. And therefore, we had proposed that upon the launch, then we can st continue to have this discussion. Unfortunately, now we're in the strike. Mm. But it's good that some of the things raised in the strike are the things that we had planned to discuss. Mm. So that tells you the goodwill of the government, mm. that we had thought about this beforehand. We had initiated those discussions. However, now we, have been, uh, we are in this situation. Mm. And therefore, what I plead for is that this discussion needs to take place. Mm. And this goodwill from the government, we should seize this goodwill, especially my colleagues from the union. Let's seize this moment and see this is a different government. Maybe things will work out differently. Mm. And that what again emboldens me when I sit here with you is now this, the direction again of the court. That some of these things are so fundamental that we need to address this as a whole of a nation approach under the leadership of the head of public service. Mm. The Honorable Judge, in his, his, in his wisdom, must have looked at those things and said, this one cannot be sorted by the Ministry of Health alone. Mm. Let's bring the entire government and the entire society so that we can be able to have this honest conversation. So now, what's the way forward? As you sit and you're looking, because Human Resource for Health is where we are at right now. The various issues, unpaid dues, um, some of them saying, you know, there are conditions for work not conducive in terms of provision of health uh, of, of uh, health insurance. Looking at the training of healthcare workers and them not completing their training because lack of resources. What's the way forward? Uh, it is a no simple solution to this problem. The way forward is that we need to be able to have this honest discussion, leverage, lobby, bring everybody into the space so that we can continue to prioritize our uh, health services in this country. We have made significant progress, Eric. Mm. Uh, in 2023, last year, in April, we released the data for Kenya Demographical Survey. And this looks at fundamental health indicators for the country. I can tell you without fear of contradiction, more children are living to see their fifth birthday more mothers are attending. In fact, our, our, our target for mothers attending antenatal clinic was 80% by the year 2030. We are 90% at, at the year 2022. Mm. And investment in health is an investment in the economy. We should not only look at health in terms of uh, as a service delivery thing, mm. but we should also look at it from a microeconomic and macroeconomic perspective that if you invest in health, people who are healthy, they are likely to be more productive and they will be able to spur economic prosperity. The other thing that uh, is that investment in health, if you look at the healthcare workers, the majority of healthcare workers are women because it's a service industry. Mm. So through that, investing in health, we also promote inclusive inclusivity, gender parity, and women empowerment. And therefore, 
that makes us move together as one whole nation instead of leaving people behind. Mm. We should continue to prioritize investment in health because of its many beneficial effects. The implementation of health and uh, this devolved system of government has had its hiccups. And the healthcare workers have been saying, you know, because we are dealing with 47 different employers, and then there's the one employer also who's national government, who also has some of our doctors, maybe we should harmonize this and have one commission. What's your view on this matter that has been pushed by doctors for so long? Have one central health services commission that employs and then um, attaches doctors to facilities or counties? Thanks, Eric. Again, I told you the health workforce is probably the most important element of any healthcare system. It takes more than 60 to 70 percent of the total health expenditure of any healthcare system in terms of wages, stipend, salaries paid to healthcare workers. And we saw the importance of uh, this element during the COVID 19 pandemic. You could be able to have the latest uh, machines, you could be able to have all the money on planet Earth, but your people would still die if you don't have. Healthcare workers. Yeah. That is a good suggestion to have a commission, but that I don't think is the one, it's not a panacea for all our problems. So we have the teacher service commission. Do you have all the teachers that we need for our schools? No, we don't. No. Are teachers not threatening to go on strike even as we discuss now? Yes. Actually, let me answer your question. Do we have enough teachers for the schools? We do. Do we employ enough teachers for our schools? We do not. Because we produce, we seem to produce more teachers than we can employ, and it appears like same with healthcare. We seem to produce more healthcare workers than we can employ. True. Yes. True. So the anomaly lies there. So why aren't we employing? Because of the size of the cake? <laughs> Doctor, is that what you're going to say? Uh, I told you my job description, and none of it deals with anything finance. <laughs> <laughs> you are the principal advisor to the Minister for Health. On technical matters. On technical matters yeah, of health. Yeah. And therefore, by extension, the principal ad advisor to the president on matters of health. True. And the advisor to the government on matters of health. The two levels of government. Right. Yeah. Both levels of government. Yeah. So when it comes to matters such as ensuring that we are meeting our needs for health care, you are the one who would say, look, with this kind of population, with uh, this kind of needs, we need this number of doctors. And then you would also say, then we therefore need to graduate this number of doctors. We need to register this number of doctors. We need to retain this number of doctors in a country per year. You are the one who's, that, who's doing that. You implemented the Jubilee Administration's universal health coverage under the Big Four agenda. You are now implementing the universal health coverage under the plan of the Kenya Kwanzaa administration. You are right, right there in the middle of it. What are you advising them in terms of the number of doctors and healthcare workers that we need in the country and allocating money for it? If you don't, like you said, you may have the best equipment, you can work on financing healthcare, you can do products and technologies, but if you do not have proper human resource for health, the entire health system will collapse. What have you told the president? Thanks, Eric. Very good question indeed. And uh, we, are, we, have, we have done some work in that space. One, last year, we did what we call the health facility census in preparation for universal health coverage. We sent healthcare workers from the counties, from our affiliated uh, institutions, our sagas, and the national government to visit more than 14,000 health facilities, public, private, first faith-based, including standalone clinics. We generated a very, very good report, which was launched towards Christmas. I think that is why it never received the public attention, mm. Mm. to be able to tell us where we are as a country in terms of infrastructure, in terms of equipment, in terms of human resources for health. And one of the things that comes out of that report is that the WHO uh, guidelines as at now for we require about 23 healthcare workers per 10,000 population. We are at 10 healthcare workers per 10,000 population. Out of the 47 counties in this country, 12 counties have achieved that global target. Mm. Therefore, 35 
are lagging behind. But don't look at this target just in its absolute numbers, in absolute entirety. We also need the skills mix and the distribution to be equitable. If you have achieved that population, uh, that, that ratio, but your healthcare workers are only in the urban settlements, mm. then again, you are not on the right trajectory to be able to achieve universal health coverage. Number two, there's a document that we are supposed to launch called the Health Labor Market Analysis. Now looking at that entire value chain from production, absorption, those who have not been absorbed, attrition, deaths, eh? mm. and even the number that we can commoditize, the number that we can be able to export outside mm. through bilateral labor agreements and uh, like the one we signed with the UK, mm. that report is ready. But that notwithstanding, still because of the tight fiscal space, we anticipate by that uh, by 2031, we'll have a shortage of nearly 100,000 healthcare workers. By 2031? 2031. Mm. Nearly 100,000 work healthcare workers. As at now, we have a total of about 190,000 healthcare workers. Mm. Our doctors who are in both public, private, and administrators like me, I'm also counted as a healthcare worker, mm -hmm. though I don't provide direct service, mm. we are about 13,000. So doctors perform about 6% of that entire health workforce. And it's also important to know that uh, healthcare workers work as teams. And therefore, you should not be able to just, just look at one facet. Mm we should not be able to discuss these things in silos. There's the role of the nurse, the role of the clinical officer, the physiotherapist, the pharmacist, the dentist. Together, together collectively is how we can be able to deliver wholesome service. Mm. So we have the numbers, we have the projections, we have the cost estimates, and uh, I will not be able to disclose that now because the report has not been officially sanctioned. Mm -hmm. uh, but that is one point of our conversation going forward. Okay. So that is you have we have tried to look at these things from a fundamental perspective, so that we can be able to deal with the root cause of this perennial industrial action. Then, okay. Daktari, mm. with UHC being one of the big five in the Kenya Kwanzaa plan to make sure that it's it's uh, implemented, this president even has his own technical advisors on health matters on universal health coverage. You, as the senior most medic, you have all this data and information and saying we need to make sure that we are training doctors, we are bringing doctors who are either training locally and abroad, they go through internship, we absorb them so that we can deliver health services the way we need to. And this is how much we need. It then does not sit well with me where a conversation then happens on you need to send interns, we don't have money. Please explain to me, is it that the explanation given at cabinet level, because this matter is that the, the budget is discussed by cabinet before it's taken to parliament. The minister for health sits there and says, this is my need. And my need, because I am supposed to provide training for health for healthcare workers, I need X for training. The National Treasury CS can sit across the table and say, I don't have enough money. What would the boss say? I need to deliver universal health coverage. Is it that the message is not packaged well enough to be understood by all? I think the message is clear to everybody except uh, the situation that we are dealing with, uh, the fiscal space. I think that is the problem. And it's not unique to Kenya, including the developed world. Despite the resources like UK, for example, there's still shortage of health workforce in the UK. It's not that they don't like lack money. If you look at the health outcomes of the United States of America, despite that investment, it's not only money. Mm -hmm. If you look at the health indicators of USA compared to a country like Costa Rica or Cuba, for that matter, mm. you'll see the disparity. America per capita expenditure on health, more than $5,000, $7,000 per person. Costa Rica, maybe one and one thousand there thereabouts but if you look at the outcomes different so the question is not only um, uh, only about money but but, but doc, which of those countries that you've given as example mm. has a drop 
in the point of training. Because posting of interns is still on training. True. We're not even talking about absorption at this point. Mm. If we are not finishing training of doctors because of financial constraints, which other country can you give us an example that has trained a doctor for six years but cannot register oh, this doctor that, because that, this doctor that, that, that is has not completed. Even Tanzania now currently is dealing with this problem. In fact, the proposal for Tanzania is that instead of now paying, uh, having the interns leave college and do one year of internship outside, they are proposing a radical departure that they do that final year, it becomes part of their training. Okay. So, and, and even Morocco, that is the way it happens. Yeah? So you do everything, internship is when you graduate. Okay, mm. but now if we if we if we look at what's happening in Kenya mm. today, and we're on the cusp of hoping to deliver UHC, mm. and we're looking at some fundamental things that must be done, do you see earnestly a situation whereby UHC will be delivered in the manner in which it was envisioned with these issues that we see currently happening? Oh, I, I'm still very hopeful because I believe this uh, this is just turbulence in the system and things will self-correct. But remember I told you our thinking of UHC, the, the fundamental departure. I know security services, services will still continue. Mm. But we believe that if you put a little bit on the primary healthcare system, and studies have been done showing clearly that if you invest a shilling in the primary health care system, then the returns are about 13, 14 shillings in return. So we believe if we can be able to strengthen our primary health care system, then we can be able to fundamentally change our health outcomes. Mm. That notwithstanding that, as we deal with the curative services, where the doctors, the interns are still paramount. I'm not saying that the primary health care system is going to replace the interns. No. Mm. The health care system must still function along the continuum of care mm. that there's somebody who will start from a primary health care level and end up in a level six super specialty hospital that care must be provided i'm skeptical mm. Mm. primary health care mm. is to be funded from taxpayers right yeah in the current spectrum right. yeah the primary health care level one, one from two. community health worker to level one level two mm. that should come from the exchequer as yes. from the national treasury yes this same one that does not have money <laughs> to train interns <laughs> to send interns to their <laughs> yeah, posts for the, the last same one <laughs> who have ensured that they are actually garnering the finance needed for this system through a different model of taxation mm. isn't it yes. Yes. so they cannot then say that they do not have money for this to send interns no no, no. You see, I don't understand. Where's the miscommunication? Training in healthcare. Is it under healthcare? Is it under the Ministry of Education? It's under healthcare. Under the Ministry, Ministry of, of Health. Yeah. Under the Ministry of Education. Education. Mm -hmm. Education. Education. Yeah. Yeah. Precisely. Yeah. So what we we're saying, therefore, mm -hmm. is that they seem not to communicate. Yeah. Mm. Silos. Typical They silo seem not behavior. to communicate. Because there is a need, and the need is obvious to all, and yet that need is not being met simply because the principles who should be communicating about this issue so that the planning and the financing of it is in order don't seem to be on the same page. But then if it's the Ministry of Education, then they have to be excused. Because right. uh, the, everything that falls under the purview is in total chaos at, at the, the moment. moment. No, 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 no. We have a whole of government approach. Okay. As Dr. Tari will remind you. True, Dr. <laughs> <laughs> all of government, all of nation. <laughs> all of government, all of nation approach. But Doc, thank you very much for joining us today. Mm. It's been an interesting conversation. Please, come again. I will. We I'll come again for two hours yes. so that the public can also get to talk to you. Yes. Oh. There's a lot, especially to understand when it comes to the thinking of UHC, how we roll out UHC, how we then improve our health services, how we even change our own uh, care-seeking behavior about health. We could discuss about UHC next time. Asante. Thank you. Dr. Patrick Amoth is the Acting Director General of Health. He's been our guest. This is The Situation Room, the only way to start your day.